Okay, praise the Lord. That is a little bit loud. Let me move my microphone just a little bit. I'm a little high. Before you start streaming, can I just get to the I think it's too late. a good sound. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Let's just hope that that's the only thing that glitches out today. Glory to God. You know, God is faithful. I remember uh, days when, uh, when we would be preaching and singing outdoors acoustically. Uh, so we're blessed to be inside where it's warm and, uh, you know, I look outside and I see the beautiful, uh, the beautiful layer of white snow. And I think to myself, at least we're not having a green Christmas this year. Uh, because I, I like a little snow for Christmas. I've been praying for it because I know... Uh, yeah, no, you can blame me. You can blame me. I told the Lord, I said, I want four inches before Christmas. And so after that, we can stop. And, uh, and so if it just keeps coming, it's probably my fault, but, uh, but that's going to be all right. So listen, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see your faces today. Uh, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come and take control. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the, the miraculous uh, resurrection, Lord God. We thank you for all that that means. And we ask, Lord God, that today, Lord God, that we would focus our hearts, our minds, and our spirits on drawing closer and closer to you. Lord, uh, it, it's, a, it's a busy week for a lot of people. It's been a busy week. And so, Father, we ask for supernatural peace to be upon this service, supernatural rest to be on this service. And so, Father, as we sing and as we lift up your name, I ask God for a spirit of refreshing, a spirit of renewing, and a spirit of freedom to be on your people today. We just ask God for you to have your way, and uh, Lord, teach us to yield in every way to your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. We're going to get announcements out of the way, and we're going to get right into worship. Um, so, of course, uh, you may have noticed some changes in the sanctuary to the decor. Uh, we have a pageant tonight, uh, and I would invite you guys to come on out. It's at 6 o'clock, and... Uh, we have all of our kids from Sunday school are going to be putting on an event, and Shannon has all sorts of 
surprises for us. Uh, so it's going to be great. I watched them rehearse a couple of weeks ago, and they're adorable. I mean, they're just adorable. Um, so I'd encourage you guys to come on out to that. Um, we have in the lobby, there's a Christmas tree uh, with tags on it for kids um, or for, for moms, needs for moms uh, or pregnant moms. Um, and so I would encourage you guys to grab a tag, buy a gift, bring it back for next week so that we can help out some moms that are in need. Um, and uh, basically everything else is canceled this week. Um, so we won't be meeting for um, prayer or youth group or any other things. I don't know, maybe the Monday morning group is, I'm not sure, but I'll let them work that out. Um, but all of our regular stuff is uh, going to be canceled um, just because everybody's going to be so busy with uh, Christmas week. So um, if you have any questions, you can see me after. Uh, and I think that is about it for announcements. So we're going to take a moment, take up our tithes and offerings, and then we're going to offer our worship up to the Lord. Amen. So the gentleman will come. I want to just thank you guys for being so faithful in your giving. I, I just got to tell you, we have a very giving and generous church, and you guys are just such a blessing. Um, we've been able to do so much the last couple of years because of your faithfulness. And uh, I look forward to what God's going to do this coming year. So, Father, uh, we just thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you that you provide all of our needs. Father, that there's nothing that, um, there's nothing that we lack, Lord God, when we're in your presence. And so, Father, today as we give back to you, we ask, Lord God, that you would uh, bless and multiply to meet the needs of this body and uh, the needs of this church. We ask that your Holy Spirit would fill fresh and new, and that in this coming season, Lord God, that we would see you more and more and feel your presence more and more. Bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. All right. Why don't you stand, come, and bring your tithes and offerings and greet one another in the Lord. And if the worship team wants to come, we're going to go... Can't. loud. Okay, so I got to speak a little louder. <laughs> All right. I love Christmas. And as you get older, I want to have something new for Christmas. Because as a child, you're looking for the presents. What did mom and dad put in my stocking? The Christmas cookies I'm going to make, which is all fabulous and wonderful. But as you get older, you can't eat so many cookies and this or that. And so it becomes where the true meaning of Christmas, all that ties in. Last year, the Lord gave me the word believe. It talked about Mary. I was so stuck. She believed what was going to happen to her because she had heard 
time after time after time the prophecy of this child that was going to come to a virgin. Can you imagine Mary in whatever room or wherever she was, and there was that angel suddenly standing before her? And what went through her mind was what she had learned as a little girl, which is back in Isaiah, which was 800 years prior to Jesus' coming. But she had been taught the Torah. And it says that at that time, there was lots of war. They, they were always waiting for war in the Middle East. Something similar going on today. The same thing. They wanted hope. They wanted peace. And so the prophecy that was given through Isaiah, which you all know, it says, look, the virgin, she will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and she will call him Emmanuel. God with you. How powerful for that little girl of 14 years old. So then you go ahead 800 years, and there she is. Over to Luke. Then you're out in the fields. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm very tired at this time of the year. There's lots to do. Can you imagine those shepherds? Probably a little more tired than me. They walked all that way to get those sheep to where they needed to be, to graze. They were missing their family. Maybe there was young shepherds that were learning to be a shepherd. How exhausting is that for that little guy? Well, all of a sudden, it says, Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. I love the word suddenly. Our God is a suddenly God. He shows up in the middle of something suddenly. And there he is to offer peace and hope. They were terrified, it says, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, for he says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, he has been born today in Bethlehem. Those shepherds knew and had heard the prophecy. They had heard about a baby, just like Mary did 800 years prior. That taught me that i got to be patient when God is speaking to me and trying to tell me something. It will come to be. The promise will come. It says, and you will recognize him by this sign. You'll find that baby all wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. This morning, Lord God, we ask that you would open the heavens as we praise unto you. Father God, would you give us a glimpse of what your glory is, God, because you are so faithful. You did that to the shepherds so long ago. God, and as those shepherds stood tired, weary, terrified, and they started to praise you, they stood in awe of what was going to happen with excitement and unbelief all at the same time. God, that's us. We are just like them, God. And we come before you, and we just want to declare, just as those angels did, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. We thank you, Lord, that praise, that praise has been from the time of the beginning. And, Lord, it also was with the shepherds. Praise was there to praise you, Lord. Take our praise, God, this morning. Visit us, Holy Spirit, visit us, we ask. Teach us something new about Christmas this year. Thank you, Jesus. You are so worthy.
Reconciled, joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the new.
those shepherds came and they stood before your little little bed, Lord Jesus. They stood in awe. This is the Messiah. To marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom?
Yes. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, that you are the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Glory this morning. Father, we just praise you. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Amen. You can be seated if you can be. Uh, how many kids want to go downstairs? Only the ones that want to go. I don't, I don't want to hear it from the other ones. Wow, there's no kids that want to go downstairs at all? All right, all right, there's a couple. Only the ones that raise their hands can go downstairs. Everybody else has to stay up here and listen to me. Oh, okay, all right. Go ahead. Amen. As we were... Uh, Singing that song, this last song, Come Let Us Adore Him, I was, um, I was thinking about, you know how sometimes your mind drifts a little bit away from what's going on? That never happens during worship. Never. I know. None of you guys ever that happens to. But for me, once in a while, my mind will drift into a different place. And, uh, but one of the things that, that happened while we were worshiping and um, it, it, it about brought me to tears is just thinking about how blessed uh, I am, how truly and unbelievably, undeservingly blessed uh, as a family, as, uh, as an individual, as a husband, as a pastor. And, you know, if we really think about it, if you are here today and you have a car that runs in your driveway, then you're in the top 10% in the world for financial blessing. If you have two, you're in the top 1%. Think about that. Um, all over the world today, there are people that are going hungry. Um, that are sleeping under bridges, uh, that are going to a, a shelter or going to a, a um, you know, to, to hoping that there's some meal that they can get at a soup kitchen. Um, and, and we have abundance. We have abundance. We're really, truly blessed. And, um, and I think we lose sight of it sometimes, but especially during this season of I want, you know, uh, I, I don't know about you, but for me personally, uh, we, we uh, ask our kids, you know, would you put a Christmas list together? I'd like to get you something, you know, things like, you know, a new car, you know, there's all sorts of things that come up with, especially as your kids enter teenagehood, the uh, price tag goes up on the want list and we forget that we have so much already. And, uh, and you know, I want to just, as we, um, as we pray, we're going to pray over the word. I want to just take a moment and just pray for those that, that really are in need um, during this season. And so would you, would you um, just pray with me? I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I just let you sit down. So, uh, Father, Lord, we just are... We're just so grateful for all that you do for us. God, for putting us in this great nation, Father God, and, and for blessing our families, for blessing our church, for blessing our community. Lord God, and Father, we thank you for all that we have. But Father, we remember those that are struggling today. Father, struggling to stay warm, struggling uh, Father, to, to keep a roof over their heads or to pay the bills. Father, struggling to, um, 
to keep a car going or to even um, have food on the table. Lord, we ask God that you would uh, help us to, to not lose sight of the blessings that we have. And Father, to, to be good stewards, Lord God, with the resources that you've given us so that others will be blessed beyond ourselves. We just thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing in our church, Lord. I thank you for the word of God that you have, uh, that you have given us so freely, so beautifully, so perfectly, Lord God. For the Christmas message, Lord God, that, uh, that gives such hope, such peace, such joy, Lord God. I pray, Father, for an anointing this morning on the, this time when we share in the word together. And I ask, Lord God, that you would touch our hearts to receive. Father, touch me to receive from this word, Lord. And Lord God, that, uh, that the very anointing and presence of God would just fill our hearts and lives. Um, so that when we leave here today, Lord God, we don't leave with that spirit of busyness or that spirit of, uh, of, of self-serving, Lord God, that so easily infiltrates this season. But Father, we leave filled with joy and a message of hope that we can share with our community. Thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we are in um, a series called Awaken, and we have been taking a look at Mary's life and what... Um, what she's been going through. And uh, today we're going to be taking a look at Luke chapter 2 again. We're going to start in verse 4. And, um, and we're looking at kind of the, the last chunk of this Awakened series. And the title of my message is Awakened for What? Awakened for What? And uh, uh, so Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 4, and it says, So Joseph went up from the, town of Bethel, uh, from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no, no guest room available for them. Verse 8, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with, with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel heard, and when the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Amen. So we've been doing this series called Awaken. And, um, and in this series, just... Uh, as, a married was, uh, as Mary was awakened, um, I hope that you've been awakened to the presence of Jesus in your life. And, um, and during this season, 
I hope that you have been able to feel his presence as you walk through this, uh, this journey that we've been on. Today we're going to shift our focus away from uh, Mary for a moment, um, and uh, we're going to be looking at the purpose to, of being awakened, because it was not just Mary that was awakened to the reality of a coming king. Um, but in our record today, and as we read, we read about some shepherds that were woken up to the presence of the Lord. And um, so tradition has it that there were three, but we don't know. It could have been 17 or, or two, uh, because, you know, shepherds is plural, so we know it wasn't one. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> A shooting star. <laughs> anyway, I thought if somebody shot the star from the back. I don't know what happened, but anyway. Uh, so it, traditionally, there were, you know, we 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 always see three shepherds uh, leading the sheep. We we have pictures of this, and, and in the nativity, we usually see three shepherds. But really, for all we know, it could have been a hundred shepherds. Could have been could have been two. Um, but just like Mary was awakened with a purpose, they were awakened with a purpose too. And I want to talk about being awakened for a purpose today. Mary needed to get ready. Uh, she was a blessed woman amongst, uh, amongst all women. She had the privilege of holding the baby Jesus in her womb. I cannot even imagine what that would have been like when I think about it. What a tremendous honor and privilege. Honestly, I can't even imagine carrying a baby in a womb anyway because I'm a guy and that just feels weird to think about. But I couldn't imagine how glorious it would be to know that you were going to give birth to the Messiah. Wow. Wow. Let that sink in just for a second. But to feel him grow inside and, and to be charged with the responsibility of raising him, to be charged with, uh, with, with holding and nursing this infant Messiah that would receive this mantle to carry literally the weight of the world on his shoulders. What an incredible calling. So in the scripture passage this morning, there are some shepherds that are tending their sheep at night. And this means they are sitting and watching sleep, uh, sheep sleep. Try saying that a whole bunch of times. Uh, which I would have to say would be about as entertaining as watching sheep eat or watching paint dry. I don't know about you, but I don't like sitting around doing nothing. But I, I would think that this would be an exhausting job. And uh, if, you can rem if you remember the, uh, the old adage that if you can't sleep, you count sheep until you fall asleep. So this is basically their job, is to sit and count sheep and try not to fall asleep. And, um, but these uh, night shift shepherds, they would have likely nodded off at some point or another during the night. And they were awakened to the sound of music and angelic singing. And uh, they were the first to receive the good news that Christ Jesus had been born. Now, I'm usually a pretty nice guy, usually a pretty kind fellow. But I don't like being woken up in the middle of the night. Does anybody enjoy being woken up in the middle of the night? Nobody, not a single one of you. What do you know? We have that in common. But I am. I'm, I'm usually a pretty nice guy, but when I get woken up, I get to be a, a bit of a grouch. I like to be left alone while I'm sleeping. And, um, you know, I get a little grouchy. Now, if there's anybody in the room that you know somebody that is grouchy when they wake up, and when they get woken up, would you just point to them right now? Look at this, all these heads. <laughs> okay, so I'm not alone. All right, I am not the only grouch in the room. I'm glad. So, uh, it's, uh, I promise you won't get in trouble. Well, no, I can't promise that. You're, if you point it to your spouse, it's all over. 
Okay, anyway, but on Sunday afternoons, a lot of the times if I've had a rough week, one of my favorite things to do is to just lay on the couch, put on a movie I've already seen so I don't have to pay attention, and just let that noise kind of drown everything else out and kind of drift off into sleep. Now, inevitably, the dog barks or someone comes stomping down the stairs or something and it wakes me up. And it doesn't bother me all that bad. It's just accepted when you have a house full of people. But there's one thing that will wake me up and cause me to go into a complete rage, just automatically. And that is when my dog decides to walk by and lick my face. <laughs> have you, anybody ever had that happen where you have this abrupt awakening to some slimy thing rolling up the side of your face? It's the worst feeling ever. When my puppy comes downstairs to check on me, he just loves to try to lick my face if I'm nodded off on the couch. And uh, I, I love that dog. I don't know why I love that dog, but I love that dog. Uh, but there's something about getting woke up with a wet, slobbery dog kiss that's pretty much the worst. It brings me to total madness instantly. And uh, there's a shock and a grossness that I cannot adequately describe. It's like a slimy ambush. And, um, but about 2,000 years ago, uh, there were some shepherds that God ambushed. I don't think he licked them. That's at least not recorded. Uh, but they were ambushed by an angel in the middle of the night. And um, this is what you would call the wake-up call of a lifetime. And for them, it happened at the same time that Mary saw the fulfillment of what the angel had told her. Now, for me... If I'm going to get woken up for something, I want it to be important. I, if I am going to wake up in the middle of the night, it's because someone, I want it to be because someone has broken in, or there is a fire, or there is an emergency that requires my attention. And when a dog licks my face, that is not an emergency. But in this case, something amazing has happened. There is incredible news. I wouldn't even mind being woken up to be told that someone is going to give birth. That wouldn't bother me a bit. But in this case, something amazing has truly happened. They received this word from the angel. The first thing, they got startled, and so the angel says, do not be afraid. And it says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you, to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Messiah in the Hebrew means anointed. In Judaism, uh, this was a word that they used when talking about expecting the king of the Davidic line who would deliver Israel from bondage. Kairos in the Greek, which is Lord, translated here in the same scripture. So when it says the Messiah, the Lord, it is master who is of a supreme authority. And this phrase has also been translated Messiah, the Lord, Christ, the Lord, uh, meaning the anointed or supreme king. And so they're getting this message about this prophetic uh, coming of a king that is, uh, that is going to be supreme, is going to bring peace. When, when the angel says Messiah, the Lord, this has extremely specific meaning to anyone in Israel. This is something that they've been waiting for so long, most of them forgot they were waiting for it. And, you know, if it was me, I would probably have picked someone other than shepherds to tell first. That's, I don't know why, it just wouldn't occur to me that a shepherd would be a good first invitation. But isn't that the Lord? 
Isn't that the Lord, that he's not interested in inviting the, the mighty or the rich or the proud first? He cares about every single one of us. And I think this is a strong message that it doesn't matter what your stature is, you're important to God. No matter where you're at in life, no matter what stage you're going through, God cares about your situation, and this message is for you. These shepherds were the first to hear the good news that the deliverer of Israel had been born and that the prophecies had been fulfilled, as we talked about last week. They'd been awakened to this good news, that Jesus, the Messiah, the Lord, the Christ, was born. But why were they awakened? If I'm asleep and I'm going to be wakened, there better be a good reason, right? Amen. Amen. It says, uh, when the shepherds, they heard the good news, they said to each other, let's go check out for ourselves what they said, basically. They, they're like, this was super cool. I don't know if you guys realize how cool this is. A, a heavenly host of angels just sang a choir to me, and, uh, and they announced that there was this coming king. And they said to each other, wow, if, was I dreaming or is this, like, is this really happening? They said to one another, let's go check this out. Let's go see. And it, it reminded me of uh, in the scriptures where uh, the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. These shepherds wanted to see for themselves. They wanted to experience for themselves. Not just that the, what the angels had said, but they wanted to go and see that it was true. They wanted to be in the very presence, not just of an angelic heavenly host. You know what, that's kind of like when you come into worship. It's kind of like when we come into the house of God. You can come into the house of God and be part of a worship service, and, and people can be singing, and there can be a great choir of heavenly hosts, if you will, in the room, all singing in harmony and in unity, and it's beautiful. And you can be part of that, and you can feel God's presence in that place and never meet Jesus. You, can, you could be in this church your whole life and never come to the feet of Jesus because we have to choose to do that. And I, I find it interesting that these shepherds, they heard, they experienced, they saw a miraculous thing, but they chose in that moment to say, you know what, I could just you know, compartmentalize this put this into memory and say, hey, wow, do you remember that time up on the hill? That was an amazing time where God showed up and it was really interesting and he told us about this thing. I wonder if it was true. But instead, they decided to get up and together take their sheep and go into Bethlehem and see if they could find this Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It says in verse 17 that when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said. I want you to take into consideration that everyone in the Christmas, in the Christmas history that we read in Luke has purpose. Every single person, every character in this story has purpose. Mary was awakened to give birth to the Messiah. Joseph was a, awakened to model manhood. 
to the Messiah. Can you imagine the responsibility of that? Fathers, we have a responsibility to model, model what it is to be a man to our children. The wise men were awakened to supply all the needs of the Messiah. They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, things of great value that would have essentially paid for the raising of this young man. The shepherds were awakened for a different reason. They were awakened to proclaim the message that the Messiah, Christ the Lord, had been born. Each of us, when we are awakened, when we come to Jesus, when we feel compelled to come to the feet of Christ, we will find ourselves in a place where we're not awakened for the sake of being awakened. It's not like when you get licked by the dog while you're sleeping on the couch. It doesn't, it's not that it doesn't have purpose. And in fact, when we come into that understanding of who Christ is, when we're awakened to that, we're going to find a joy and a peace in that. Just like it said in the scriptures, but it's going to come with purpose. You know, when I'm not doing the thing that I'm called to do, I don't have joy. When I'm not doing the thing that God has put in my life to do, I don't have peace. When God awakens us to the reality of his presence, it almost always comes with a very specific purpose. That we each will have a part to play in the story of Christ in our lives. And so each one of us today, here today, if you've been awakened to the reality of this coming Jesus, you've got a purpose to play. You've got a purpose to play. And I can't tell you what that is. I don't know. But I think you should. And you should seek the Lord to know why he's chosen you for such a time as this. Why are you here today? You know, God has a tremendous plan and a tremendous purpose. That does not mean that it's an easy life. But if we follow the Lord and we follow his purpose for our lives, it will be filled with joy. It will be filled with peace. It will be filled with This morning, we're just a, a few days before Christmas. Many of us are experiencing the joy and the peace and happiness that comes from this festive uh, season. I have been feeling that way lately. Um, and it's wonderful. But on the other hand, there are many others experience the agony of what is known as the blue Christmas. Um, one psychiatrist said that while Christmas brings joy to many, it stirs feelings of sadness in others. Why is it that some people feel blue at Christmas? Why is it that during the week immediately following Christmas and the first week of the new year, there are more um, admissions to psychiatric wards than any other two-week period? Why is it there are more attempts made to commit suicide during those two weeks following Christmas than any other period throughout the year? Christmas is a time of joy for some, and a time of real depression for others. And there's a number of contributing factors. Um, some experience depression at Christmas time because they have exaggerated expectations of themselves or others. They hope that Christmas will solve their family problems or relationship problems. And when it doesn't, they go into despair. Christmas brings out a need for dependence on others. And at times they fail us or we've lost someone, or we feel that loss more completely because they're not there, and this can be very depressing, very hard. In the United States, Christmas is family-oriented, and um, often family fails us. And so rather than memories that are blissful, they're blight. Or rather than memories that are helpful, they're hurtful. 
And so it's highly possible that each of us will come into contact with someone during the next couple of weeks who's experiencing depression or is stressed by the pressures of the season or is feeling broken by the weight of the season. And maybe you're here today and maybe you're having a blue season. But God is with you. The Christmas season is a time where more alcohol is purchased and consumed than any other period of the year. People use alcohol as a method of coping with stress and depression. With the use of alcohol as a beverage, it relieves tension temporarily, but it brings on a depression that's even worse. And it does not remove the stresses of life, except for a moment. Can I tell you that I believe that the reason that most people struggle this way is because instead of receiving the good news of the season, the good news of the gospel, they're trying to find good advice to deal with the bad news that they've received in life. And every one of us, we've had bad news delivered. We have had bad news delivered at some point, whether it's this year or last year or the year before. Every one of us will experience a phone call that changes our lives. Um, maybe uh, divorce papers are served or you get a call in the middle of the night that brought bad news that you didn't want to hear. Several years ago after Thanksgiving, just before Christmas, my wife heard the worst words you can hear as an expecting mother. I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. Um, in life, we have moments that rock us to our core and they bring us right to our knees. We have moments and seasons in our lives and, and these moments, um, there are two things that we can hold on to, really. There's really only two and that's good advice or good news. And the problem with good advice is without good news, it fails you every time. It's nothing to hold on to. It has no substance. But if you have good news, if you have some hope that has been delivered to you, if you have something that will bring you peace during the impossible situations of your life, you can get through those blue seasons. If you have that good news that will bring you hope. And so I hope that this morning, you're not leaning on the good advice, but the good news. In New Hampshire, 98% of people do not attend Bible-believing churches. And most of them have never heard a clear presentation of the good news, which brings joy and strength and peace. So they settle for good advice and a scotch on the rocks to dull the pain. And it brings temporary happiness, but it leaves them feeling deeper and more entrenched in the depression and anxiety of the next day. Most of this is because in their life they have lots of good advice for bad news. Does this message of Christmas have anything to say to the people that are feeling depressed, full of anxiety, or maybe are alone? Christianity, which brings with it a promise of good news that will bring great joy, is much more than good advice. It's so much more than good advice. And honestly, if you think that the gospel is just good advice, you've missed it. You've missed it. I'm going to tell you, there's tons of good advice in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, and it, there's tons of great things to read in the Bible. And there's lots of good advice on how to manage your finances, how to raise your children, how to have a good marriage, how to, uh, how to just be a, a person of integrity that people trust. There's tons of good advice. But if you miss the good news, 
You're just walking in religion. I want to challenge you to go beyond the advice today and to get into the peace and the joy of this season that Jesus Christ is born. Ooh, good catch. Instead of the good news that there is a God who is called Emmanuel, God with us, meaning if you're alone, you're not alone. Christ the Lord, the anointed King, supreme, the deliverer that empowered us to overcome the anxiety and brokenness of this life and brings peace and wholeness through the Christ who came to and was born on this first Christmas, God provides us with the ability to not just cope with life in a manner that will bring us joy and peace, but he also calls us into purpose. John chapter 10, verse 10 says this, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that there may be life, and have it abundantly. What kind of life are you living? I want to. I'm just going to ask this question: What kind of life are you living? Can I tell you that I don't believe that God calls us to just get up in the morning, go to a job we don't like? work eight to ten hours a day, come home tired, be exhausted, do it again tomorrow, and again next week, and the week after that, only to take an a, a vacation that doesn't make you feel rested. You know what I mean? And, you know, and do that again next year, and do it the year after that, and do it at, at the year after that until you retire, and then you die. <laughs> honestly, I think people think that that's what life is. I, and, and honestly, I was in a place like that in my life at one point in time. It seemed like that was the, that's all I do. I just get up and I, you know, take care of things and I do this and I do that and I don't enjoy any of it. But you know what? There was a reason. And, and honestly, I got to tell you, the reason that I was feeling that way, because I, I had received the good news, but I hadn't stepped into purpose. And I, I believe that there's people here today, you've heard this story, you probably heard this story 20 times, 30 times, 40 times, 150 times. You've, you've heard it over and over and over, but you've never stepped into the purpose. And the purpose is God has called you for a reason. He's awakened you for a reason. He didn't just lick your face to tick you off. He woke you up for a purpose. And I hope today as we're going through this and and as we're seeing this, no matter where you're at, whether you're in a blue Christmas moment or a joyous season in your life, that you'll come to a place where you say, you know what, God, I want more than just that casual walk. I want more than just the mundane in life. God, I want to have purpose. I want to walk in the abundance of life because that is what was provided for you Christmas Day. Jesus said, I came that you would have life, and that life more abundantly. It's not just good advice. It's good news. The angel who announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds was bringing good news that continues to be good news for all of us who will listen and respond. There's good news about God in the gospel. 
the message of Christ, of Christmas is that God is behind, the God that is behind and above it all is a living God. The Bible doesn't seek to tell us when or how the universe came into being. Its major concern is the who and the why. The writer of the book of Hebrews describes that by faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God. But now in this moment in history, God declares that he is more than the one who created the world with, for us to live in, but also that he is the God who comes into the world to walk with us and be with us and eventually is in us. The message of Christmas proclaims that the good, the good news about the living God who loves us enough to walk with us in this life and to carry our burdens. Jesus came onto this earth, and this is something that people don't always understand, is that when Jesus came as a, as a baby, he came and he lowered himself to the form of a human being. He was all God. And he made himself all human. He scraped his knee. He knows what it is to have his hair pulled in school by that kid that just treats people rotten. Because there's always one, right? Jesus understood the pain of thorns. He understood the pain of grief. He understood the recklessness of the rage of mankind. He understood it all. So he came not just to die for us, but he came to experience what we experience. In Jesus Christ, the living God declares to us that he cares enough that he wants to help us in our anxieties, our sickness, our disappointment, and our failures. The good news of Christmas is not only that he is with us, but that he is with all of us. Turn to the person behind you or in front of you and say, you are part of the all. Poke them and say, you're part of the all. The, the good news of Christmas is that you are part of the all. The good news of Christmas is universal in its application, for it meets the deepest needs of the people of all colors, cultures, and countries. Third, God in Jesus Christ comes with good news regarding the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness does not appear in the glossary of the psychiatric dictionary. <laughs> Did you know that? Psychiatrists cannot prescribe forgiveness. Doctors cannot prescribe forgiveness, but we can experience forgiveness, which often is what's behind our depression and our anxiety. Jesus came that we might, that he might bear the penalty of all of our sins. Jesus brings the good news about belonging. If you're feeling alone, there's no better place to be than in a church full of people that love you. A warm, small group can provide tremendous support for anyone who's experiencing the problems of life. A genuine Christian friend can be a tremendous value in a time of crisis. Church, we are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet of Christ. And in this Christmas season, let us extend hands of Christian love and fellowship to those who are experiencing loneliness and discouragement. You know, there's a lot of that going on. People that have lost people, people that are, you know, I know three families right now that are quarantined. Going to be quarantined for Christmas. How hard is that? We need to be hands and feet for them. Paul bears testimony saying, I can do all things in whom who strengthens me. The psalmist bears testimony saying, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He brings good news 
regarding help. God is our refuge, our strength, our very present help in time of trouble. And lastly, the Christ brings us the good news concerning a precious home at the end of the road. John 14, verse 1 to 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have, would I have told you that I go to a place go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am you may also be many homeowners consider their home to be their best investment but there are others who never have the joy of owning a house they can call their own through the grace of God and the provision of his son Jesus Christ all believers can look forward to having a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven when this life is over. As we close out the service today, I want to um, just bring this to mind. In, in a world in which there is much bad news brought to us each day um, via newspapers and radio and television and every other method known to mankind. Let us listen to the good news that comes, to God, comes from God through Jesus Christ. Let us individually respond to the full implications of the good news the angels sang about on the first Christmas. Let us accept Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah who came to meet the deepest needs of our lives. Let us trust in the depth of his forgiveness and in his resurrection and living, in, living presence for the gift of eternal life. Let us faith, face life with the resources of his promises. Let us as Christ, Christians this Christmas season Find the purpose, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, when he said, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There were some shepherds sitting in a field just doing their thing, living a simple life, an ordinary life, as anyone ever, ever has lived, if you really think about it. They were probably people just like you, living life as it comes at you, dealing with things as it comes at you, trying to deal with the constant barrage of bad news, looking for good advice to get through each day. And then one day a messenger, an angel, sent good news. Today, as we close out this service, let me read to you our passage of Scripture one more time. But this time, let's pretend that you're the shepherd that's receiving this news. Let's pretend just for a moment that you're on a hillside just doing your thing. And today, an angel came before you to give you good news. Would you stand with me? This message that I'm about to read to you, I'm going to modify just slightly so that it applies directly to you and is spoken directly to you. But this message is timeless, and it's a message for all. Let's pray. feel like the Lord would say to you, do not be afraid, no matter what you're going through right now. 
no matter what you're experiencing, I bring you good news that causes great joy for all people if you'll receive it. Today I tell you that in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace to those who find favor with Him. Today, you can find favor with Him. Today, God wants you to receive this good news, that the Messiah has come, and that you can come into His favor and find peace and joy and live a life to the fullest with purpose and freedom. Today, you've been presented with good news, the best news that's ever been given, that Jesus Christ was born, that he died for you, that he came for you so that you can have freedom and peace and joy throughout this life. Father, we accept your freedom. God, we accept your joy. We accept your peace into our lives. And we ask, Lord God, that we would um, take not just the good advice from your word, but, Father, that we would really truly receive the good news that Jesus Christ came for me, to die for me, and to die for you. And we ask, Lord God, that as we leave today, Father, we would leave with that joy, that sense of purpose. Father, help us to find it if we haven't. Help us to see, help us to be in your will. In Jesus' name, amen. It's quiet in here. You guys, everybody must be tired and sleepy today. <laughs> Listen, enjoy the day. There's coffee in the lobby. Feel free to fellowship. And if you need prayer, I'm up here. <laughs>